Welcome to the Open Education Network Summit. Thank you for joining us for today's session entitled Advancing Social Justice and DEI on Campus Through OER, Librarian Faculty Advocacy Partnerships That Work. My name is Tanya Groves and I'm the Director of Educational Programs for the Open Ed Network. If you're not familiar with us, we're a community of higher ed organizations working together to make education more equitable, accessible, and affordable through open education. You can learn more about us at this link, which, let's see if it worked. Um, so that's open.umn.edu forward slash OEN. Before we begin, the OEN is housed at the University of Minnesota. Twin Cities, which is located on traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of indigenous people. The university resides on Dakota land ceded in the treaties of 1837 and 1851. We acknowledge this place has a complex and layered history. This land acknowledgement is one of the ways in which we work to educate the campus and community about this land and our relationships with it and each other. We're committed to ongoing efforts to recognize, support, and advocate for American Indian nations and peoples, and we thank them for their persistence through a violent history. Please feel free to acknowledge the indigenous people to whom the land you are situated on belongs in the chat if you so if you feel so inclined. I will now be handling this session off to Wade Oshiro from Leeward Community College. Wade, uh, Wade is a member of the Summit Planning Committee and an instructor for our certificate in OER librarianship, and he will introduce the session and monitor the chat. Welcome. Thank you, Tanya. As we begin the session, we'd like to share a few important details with you. This webinar is being recorded. For that reason, you have been muted. The video transcripts and slides will be posted on the OEN's 2021 YouTube Summit playlist after the summit has concluded. And I'll share a link in the chat for you. The last 15 minutes of today's session will be for questions. Uh, to submit a question uh, for our presenters, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. We will not have a chance to ask all the questions to presenters, but we will try our best. The chat will be a space to share additional comments or reactions. We are committed to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for all attendees. You can learn more about our community norms at um, z.umn.edu slash community norms, and I'll share a link in the chat right now. The hashtag for the summit is OEN Summit 21. And also please join us on Twitter um, at OpenEd underscore network. And now please join me in welcoming today's presenters, Elaine Thornton and Dr. Jacqueline Wiersma Mosley. Elaine Thornton is the Open Education and Distance Learning Librarian at the University of Arkansas, Fayetteville. She leads campus OER advocacy initiatives, including faculty workshops, an OER funding program, and OER publishing. And I would also like to note that Elaine also serves as one of the Certificate in OER Librarianship Instructors. Dr. Jacqueline Wiersma Mosley is a Professor of Human Development and Family Sciences at the University of Arkansas Fayetteville, Fayetteville, excuse me. Her research program focuses on interpersonal violence and her teaching program focuses on creating curricula to increase cultural competence via the Intercultural Development Inventory, or IDI, in the Multicultural Families and Cultural Competence courses that she developed. Both courses utilize OER textbooks and resources. And now I turn it over to you, Elaine and Jacqueline. Great, well, thank, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you for the great introduction, Wade. Um, just to kind of remind everyone, um, I'm Jackie Mosley. I'm a professor of human development and family sciences. I have taught several courses, um, developed them myself over the last 10 years, multicultural families, cultural competence. And I've been at the University of Arkansas for over 10 years. And I can say I really only truly learned what OER 
is in the past several months, thanks to Elaine and all her amazing work on our campus. So I'm really excited to be here. I'll let Elaine talk next. Okay, and as Wade said, my name is Elaine Thornton and I am the Open Education and Distance Learning Librarian at the University of Arkansas. And I've been involved in open education for about five years. And I lead the uh, open education campus initiatives here on our campus. Thank you for attending our presentation today. Uh, we'll present briefly, and then our goal is to have some discussion with the community. Um, you'll enter you know, answers to the questions that we ask at the end on chat. Um, uh, we wanna have a discussion about the strategies uh, you might employ to increase awareness and advancement of OER as a component of de equity and inclusion and a vehicle for social justice. So I'll begin with an overview of the OER program at the University of Arkansas and talk a little bit about our workshop program. And because basically that's how Jackie and I met earlier this year. Uh, and then Jackie will discuss her participation teaching and DEI leadership roles on campus and our future collaborative plans. We'll then invite the discussion and then uh, follow that up with questions. So our program was established at the end of 2016 when Carolyn Henderson Allen, who was then the Dean of the Libraries, committed funding and established a partnership with the university's global campus unit. The vice, vice provost for distance learning who heads up the global campus committed both financial support in the form of faculty project funding and personnel, primarily instructional designers, to the initiative. This has really been a productive partnership. I've been so fortunate to work with the fabulous instructional designers, media team, graphic designers, and academic technologists who support our online learning programs. They are always willing to lend their expertise to OER projects. And they're always gracious, helpful, and eager whenever I call on them for assistance. They bring a diverse set of skills and knowledge to the program. So the primary initiative work is carried out by the Open Education Librarian, that would be me, with assistance from the OER core team, which is made up of a small group of librarians and instructional designers. We, who help with things like instructional design, licensing, metadata, uh, programs, presentations, and open ed week act activities. We also have an OER campus advisory group and they provide feedback and re review funding applications. This group includes faculty, including some OER adopters, university staff, such as one of the directors of the campus accessibility office, the campus bookstore manager, a student government representative, graduate students, and a campus administrator. So the elements of our program include, um, our original program was created to increase awareness of OER and provide funding for faculty who wanted to create OER. So we have the advocacy part and we also have the uh, materials part. We issue a call for applicants each semester and instructional designer and I meet individually with each potential uh, applicant to discuss the basics of OER have a high level discussion of Creative Commons licensing and discuss the requirements of our funded program. We then discuss the potential participants OER adoption or creation idea. And after that, I send them the funding application. So none of our uh, participants have access to the application. Make sure that we're all on the same page regarding uh, the, uh, the constructs of OER in our program. We've seen significant growth over the last four years and have been able to sustain our funding and have recently received additional funding for the, the last semester from the Associated Student Government and the new Center for Student Success. And we'll look at some figures in a moment. But like everyone else, we constantly wrestle with issues surrounding growth and sustainability. We want more projects, more adoption, uh, to have more student impact. But with this, we know comes more increased, comes increased demand on our funding, time, and other resources. One of, our, uh, one of our newest goals now is to broaden the focus of the initiative by being more intentional about diversity and equity issues as they relate to open sources, open resources. 
we will begin to intentionally encourage our university community to consider OER adoption as an equity and social justice issue and as a way to address the lack of diversity, inclusion, and representation in commercial course materials. So here are our stats over the past four years. The percentages seem small, but the growth has been steady and even dramatic over the last two years. The first OER uh, funded adoptions were creation projects and they launched in the 2017-18 school year. They were in physics and agricultural economics. We've gone from two adoptions in the 2017-18 school year to 38 faculty teaching 20 courses, some with several sections using OER in the 2020-2021 school year. We've gone from impacting over just over 100 students that first uh, school year to more than 4,500 for the last uh, school year 2020-2021. And we now have a strong group of OER faculty champions. They deserve much of the credit for our OER uptick. They not only participate in our campus OER programming by sharing their experiences with other faculty, but they also encourage their colleagues to explore OER adoption and creation. So that was an overview of our initial programs. We are always looking for new ways to reach out to more faculty and spread more awareness and to increase our advocacy for OER and even for textbook affordability in general. One of our newest programs is the Affordable OER Workshop. We run the workshop in February. Faculty apply for it in the fall and then participate in February. Um, faculty in this program learn more about OER. It's a four week program. We meet once a week for four weeks. Uh, and we had to do that virtually this year. Uh, so they learn more about OER, open licensing, course design, and they explore adopting or creating OER for their courses. So they don't make a commitment when they apply for the program to adopt OER. They just commit to doing an open textbook review and to uh, participating so that they can learn more and hopefully become advocates. So if OER is not available for their course, we do then explore adopting library resources to replace the course textbooks. And that's in the case that they cannot or do not want to create materials. Um, so, as I said, in this pr program, participants also review a uh, textbook for the Open Textbook Library. Uh, Dr. Mosley participated in our second iteration of this program just this past February, and she not only adopted the textbook she reviewed for her cultural competence course, but she also took on advocacy as a personal, personal mission. Um, by reaching out to her own academic department colleagues in the College of Agriculture. And what her engagement highlights is the value of each individual faculty member stepping up to promote, and in this case, change to OER from traditionally published textbooks to the colleagues that they know best. So I'll turn the presentation over to Jackie and she can tell you more about her work and efforts to expand OER uh, in her department and on campus. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, so I wanted to give some quick background on our campus at the U of A. So DEI or diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives have increased significantly in the past several years, just like all college campuses, I think across the US. And especially each unit now on our campus, like each department, each center, each college, pretty much everyone who has staff or faculty, they're required to create the, their own DEI policy plans, setting short, mid range, long term goals for students, as well as faculty and staff. And so I'm our unit or our school's leader in DEI efforts, um, mainly because of the passion that I have for DEI, um, the, the teaching that I do, my, it surrounds my research, my service. Pretty much everything I do is related to DEI and cultural competence. So as I said earlier, I developed several courses, one of them being a brand new course called Introduction to Cultural Competence. And it's now one of our general education requirements and it fulfills 
at the same time, two new learning outcomes that are required for all students on our campus, and those are diversity and cultural competence. So I created this course to really be an introductory course, a sophomore level course, an introduction to topics such as culture, identity development, stereotypes, biases, microaggressions, privileges, learning about experiences of African Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans, LGBTQ+, as well as individuals with disabilities and, and more. I've organized the course really around that intercultural development inventory um, an assessment and, and framework. I'm trained in it and it really has informed my research and my teaching. And I've found through my curriculum um, that it, it works. I'm significantly increasing my students' cultural competence over the course of a semester, as well as other important factors like ethnic identity and um, white privilege awareness and things like that. So the challenge was just with this course is that it's 100% online. So it's an asynchronous online course. So I have very little interaction with my students except for videos. Um, and also what I found is that there were no textbooks. If you Google cultural competence, nothing comes up. There's lots of definitions, but there's no textbook. There's really very few resources available. So I kind of had to improvise and find my own. And uh, since I'm a researcher at heart, I always ask students and give them surveys. And so probably midway through the semester last fall, when I first created this course or first taught it, I sorry, I surveyed my students just to ask what they thought about the course. And without asking them about textbook per se, they were telling me in their feedback that they would like a textbook, which actually surprised me as a faculty member, right? We think they don't want to read, but they do. Um, I was really using like journal articles and online web pages, and a lot of them reported they didn't think that they were very relevant or they were just really long, right? This is a very introductory course. So journal articles really wouldn't be um, adaptable for sophomore level. And at the same time that fall, I came across the information about the OER workshop in our campus newswire that Elaine talked about. And I thought, okay, I need to learn more about OER. Maybe this is what could be what I'm looking for because I'm really struggling with resources. And it honestly was the best decision I made. After contacting Elaine, she immediately emailed me tons of resources and potential textbooks. Um, one of which those I, I reviewed in the OER workshop and I loved it, fell in love with it. I mean, there was some things I could still address and, and, and wanna change. Um, but I learned that I could do all that. And so I incorporated it right away in my spring course. So this spring 2021, I utilized that textbook in my course. So I surveyed my students again this spring and asked them, did you like the textbook? And overwhelmingly, they said they loved it, especially that it was online, especially that it was free. And they said they wished more faculty and instructors provided textbooks like this that are free online resources. So they actually like thanked me for the textbook. So I gained a ton of amazing resources for my class and I learned a lot about OER through this workshop with Elaine and her team, things I had never known before. And you know, and I had heard of OER before, but I really didn't know what it was. And so after kind of talking with Elaine and, and thinking about faculty, I was thinking, I bet other people don't know what this is. You know, faculty just don't know what they don't know, right? So I didn't, and I had been here for over 10 years, and I'm someone who I think values teaching and, and as well as social justice. And to me, OER is like that connection for those. Um, so Elaine and I met, we talked about sort of a method we would come up with. Um, and it's funny, I found out through talking with her that I had in fact met her several years ago when she came to one of our faculty meetings and talked about OER. I didn't really remember it because our faculty meetings are at like three o'clock on a Friday afternoon. So I think most of our faculty were really ready to get out of the door, right? So I doubt many of them paid attention to her and what she was saying. And I also think timing is so important back then I wasn't really looking for resources or looking for a textbook. I was teaching a different course, wasn't really thinking about that. And so now I was creating this new course and you know the whole course is on social justice, right? So timing is really important. So um, there is also something valuable about talking with a colleague or a peer 
and influencing them and telling them about your experiences versus someone who comes into a faculty meeting and you don't know that person, right? So we thought maybe I would reach out to all of my colleagues. Um, obviously, Elaine did all the upfront work on this. She was the one who helped me find resources and textbooks for every single one of my colleagues, courses that they taught. So I was able to give her the names and the courses. So we worked together. And I wanted to do this before we emailed them. I didn't want to just email faculty and say, hey, you should look into OER. I wanted to have links for them because that, that was really a you know, big time saver for me. So what we did is we got all those together. We kind of organized it in a system. And I emailed each colleague that I have in my department, which is about 20, 25 um, colleagues, and individually provided them with specific resources and textbook and or links for the classes that they taught. I also wrote in the email that I don't think many of us have heard about how impactful OER can be for our classes. And I encourage them to, at the very least, look at the various resources, textbooks, assignments, et cetera, for their, for their courses to adapt or not. And I, 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 I'm reading off the email now that I wrote, but I said, first and foremost, this textbook would be free and accessible to all our students. We have the ability to directly impact our students' ability to attend, succeed in, and graduate from college. Goldrick Robb wrote in an article that higher education should be equally accessible to all, yet the likelihood of earning a college degree is tied to family income. And by the way, I got that resource from the OER workshop. So, And so I wrote, in my opinion, this system, i.e. expensive textbooks, falls under the umbrella of diversity, equity, inclusion, and I am adding OER as another goal for our unit's DEI policy. So some of the faculty, and I'm writing this in the email, may be hesitant thinking about that OER means poor quality, which is just a myth. I found an OER textbook for my own course, and it's fabulous. In addition, something I learned through the workshop is you can, you can adapt the textbook, meaning reorganize chapters, delete, or add information to it, which you could never do with a traditional textbook. To me, those were the ding, ding, dings for faculty, right? Um, I did write that the drawback is there may not be a textbook for your class. And I'm finding that with my own course, another course that I teach on multicultural families. However, I encourage my faculty to take five minutes of their time and to reach out to Elaine and myself if they had questions. And I said, it could save your students each $100 or more. Oh, and the best news, you don't have to deal with the campus bookstore bugging you every semester about what textbooks you're going to use. So to me, that was like the final, like, yes, um, which is a huge advantage for me. I hate when the, tech, the campus bookstore bugs you every semester. So kind of Elaine termed what I was doing as an OER champion, and that's what I, 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 I took on that mission. And I want to continue being an ally for OER and championing it to my colleagues. So what did we find our impact? Well, um, with anything involving faculty, not everything went out as planned, <laughs> um, but I think that at least a lot of them were able to look at the links that we provided them. Some of them immediately contacted Elaine, like within the week and decided to go with OER for this fall 2021 semester they're adding um, OER texts in their classes. Some even went and applied for OER funds and were awarded. So they'll be participating this fall in the, the different workshops and other um, OER mechanisms. You know, some ignored me, so that's fine. Um, some said maybe, so I've continued to slightly sort of nudge them. I think I just emailed another person last week and said, hey, have you uh, considered OER yet? Let me know, it's the summer, you have time. <laughs> Um, also, we had some faculty who left the department and we'll have some who will start this fall. And so what I plan to do is just to reach out to those new faculty this, this fall and ask them and let them know about OER. And the thing is, it's easy. It takes me a few minutes to email someone and reach out, right? And I actually have been thinking about this a lot and that think about the influence that I or we could have when we're all back in person right? These are all with emails. And so I'm pretty excited to be in the department, in our offices, or in a faculty meeting, and really talking about OER with my passion. I don't think my passion comes out so much in an email. So I think we have 
way more growth coming in the next year now that um, we're slowly coming back to having real relationships with each other again. So. So Elaine and I have several goals moving forward that we're excited about um, doing in the next year and then and so on. So the first thing is that we plan to do the same method by reaching out to all the colleagues in my college, which is an agricultural college. Um, we plan to reach out to departments like agriculture education, you know, poultry science, animal science, and others. Um, I'm one of the DEI leaders in our college, and so I plan to utilize that role as well as connect with my DEI colleagues, the other reps from the other departments, and to really reach out to faculty to let them know about OER, because again, I think faculty just don't know about OER. And so this is a really great um, tool to use. Um, and I, of course, do this with all of Elaine's help. So it's a lot of really work for her. <laughs> So the second plan is um, we want to go bigger. Obviously, we don't want to just stay within our own college. There are so many other units and faculty and, and, and instructors across campus. So I think by using our campus DEI leaders, there's there they are housed in every college. Um, Elaine and I plan to reach out to all of them, all the instructors, especially first the ones I might know across other units and departments, and provide them with resources and texts um, individually with links for their respective classes. And then really the last thing was hard to kind of summarize, but I think it's really important, just like with social justice, um, OER just needs to be emphasized in everything we do. So for example, I'm currently um, working on a teaching grant with a colleague and we're creating student videos of hearing from students and their voices about what cultural competence means to them. And so we're gonna, create those as OER videos so that other campuses can utilize those. Because again, we're finding there's not that many resources out there. And so to me, that's my next sort of step is kind of creating OER resources related to social justice. Um, another thing that I was thinking about is service. You know, a lot of us are service, we're serving on committees, that it's easy enough to just relay OER information to colleagues on various committees of whatever capacity you serve, if it's related to teaching or related to DEI or so on. Um, next, I'll be using OER in all of my courses. So even though it's been difficult to find resources for multicultural families, um, you know, which is a required senior level course for um, our majors, and our majors are mostly child development majors, Elaine has been really helping me find resources for the class. I mean, I did have a textbook that I loved and it was hundreds of dollars. And then I went to an online text, which was still $75. So I'm really trying to be more inclusive and in finding resources. Um, I, I will say that the OER is limited in terms of understanding and learning about Latinx families, LGBTQ plus families and more. And so I think that there is definitely a need for OER resources related to social justice and, and cultural competence. Um, I also, I, I plan to promote OER in my teaching presentations as well as my research. Um, you know, a lot of the research that I write about is um, really addressing teaching methods, right, that are re re promoting scholarship through teaching and learning. And OER is one of those mechanisms that I think so many different teaching disciplines could use more um, knowledge about and, and more and just more understanding. And finally, I hope to emphasize the importance of OER with my colleagues who are going up for tenure and promotion uh, or various teaching awards and how really beneficial and innovative OER is as another mechanism to really assess a faculty member's teaching. Um, I think it's one thing that's left out of our annual reviews. And so I'm hoping to utilize this and the fact that more of our, our unit is getting involved in OER I'm actually hoping to uh, apply for a teaching award for our whole school because I think it's a mechanism that shows that we care about student learning. So these are just a few. There's probably so many more um, that we'd love to hear about, but we need to continue promoting OER systemically and, and in everything we do, just as we would in creating change for, for social justice. So, as I said before, our goal is to be more intentional going forward. You know, this is the goal of the OER team 
And Jackie's already shared with you some of the things that she and I will be working on. Um, and, you know, whereas Jackie and I might automatically think about teaching curriculum and resources from these with these kind of issues in mind, because of who we are in our personal or academic interests, we know that others don't necessarily approach their course material selection or teaching approaches from this perspective. In the opening session on Monday, one of Dave's slides read, how do open educational resources and practices encourage more equitable, inclusive, and diverse classrooms? And I thought this was really great because this is kind of what we've been thinking about as well. Um, it perfectly summed up the direction we hope to move uh, to, more to be more intentional on our campus. As we try to advance these issues, one of the things the OER team will be doing to better incorporate social, social justice and DEI into our work and outreach with faculty, um, for us, it starts with the inclusion of more resources in our guides, workshops, and in our program documentation. So for example, the OER Champions Guide will now include a link to um, the University of Maryland Global Campus Guide on DEI and OER. And um, also will include uh, the OpenStax Improving Representation and Diversity in OER uh, document. And I have uh, links to those resources at the end of the slide, slide deck. So this is all in addition to the examples of active work that Jackie uh, mentioned previously. So now we'd like to hear from some of you about um, ways that you, know, you think that you might promote or ways that you do promote uh, OER as a social justice issue on your campus. So the first question, and you can uh, put that in the chat and hopefully Wade will help us uh, read through those. First question, how do you promote OER as a social justice issue? And while you um, think about what you're going to uh, submit in the chat, um, in response to um, Jackie and Elaine's question there, um, there have been uh, quite a few comments coming through in the, uh, the chat, so I'd like to share some of those. Um, Amy uh, Hoffer said, it's great to hear about such a deep partnership between a librarian and disciplinary faculty member. So kudos for how effective this has been to persuade others. And yeah, it just seems that, uh, uh, Jack, you mentioned earlier about the timing. You know, you weren't ready uh, when Elaine came to you early, you know, a few years ago, but this time the timing was right and it, it really is seems to be such an exceptional and deep partnership that you've developed in such a short period of time. Um, some, uh, there are several comments on the, uh, the text that you're using, uh, Jackie. Um, can you share about that? Can you share a link to that text? I'm, I'm looking for it right now to put in the, in the chat. Okay, great, great, thank you. And um, some comments came in earlier about um, keeping the bookstores in the loop, uh, just because that's where students tend to uh, go for their course materials. And also because some students may, uh, you know, either have a preference for or require a more, um, a different, more accessible version of the text, a print preference. Has that come up in your, uh, within your classes? With it your actually students? did. Um, in the surveys that I, that I used, um, students did say that they, they didn't really love them being online and they wish that they could have them at, you know, as a hard copy. And so um, that is something they can print. It's, it's probably not the same thing and wasting a lot of paper. So um, it is a comment I've gotten. A question that came in uh, earlier, I just want to get to it before. Um, uh, we go to uh, the responses to your question is, um, how many faculty um, participated in the cohort? So in, in our last workshop cohort, we had three faculty, which, you know, it was COVID. So considering the fact that we had to move everything off campus, um, you know, it makes for a nice, small, intimate group. Um, two of them were from the College of Agriculture, and one of them was uh, a music professor. So, you know, very different interests. I think the other person from the College of Agriculture was a uh, uh, apparel design faculty. So, you know, we, we don't, um, you know, it's not a discipline specific workshop, but it's, you know, kind of an open. And then they always all learn 
uh, things from each other. In our previous year, when we piloted the workshop, we had, um, I think, the same number of faculty. And it's clear that uh, even though the cohort was small, that uh, with Jack, you, you found a, a faculty um, not only advocate, she's a change agent, right? She's, she's, she's a champion, you know, uh, in um, spreading the word and tying it into larger institutional um, initiatives over, uh, around DE, DEI. Um, there's some uh, responses to your question. Um, so Sybil said, I tell faculty and admin that I can't control their housing or food costs, but I can control textbook costs, which helps uh, those students who don't have that financial ability. Um, Anna says OER enables faculty to overhaul their syllabi and curriculum so that their course is more inclusive, equitable, and includes content from div diverse authors and creators. And Sybil says, I put non-white names in the textbooks and textbook and use as much OER written by non-white authors as I can find. Um, yeah. Um, Janelle says, I share data about student success being correlated with having the textbook and then share data about how many students don't have the textbook and then show what kinds of students are most effective on our campus. Yeah. And Amanda says they started offering a racial justice grant offering folks for folks who want to include materials that address DEI in a course focused on encouraging student reflection and discussion on race and racism, incorporating diverse voices and course content from historically marginalized scholars. And Chris is saying he's from a museum beginning to dabble in OER. And for us, one of the advantages is the shareability, um, helps increase our reach. And in our area where busing costs are a real issue, especially along racial lines. And then, yeah, Daisy just um, kind of reiterates what uh, Sybil said about starting OER conversations on basic uh, student basic needs and financial impact and how that can impact student and academic success. Um, and thanks, uh, Jacqueline, for sharing uh, the link to your textbook. I think a lot of people were interested to see what you're uh, using in your courses. And kudos to you for actually converting to all OER, even though the uh, resources aren't necessarily, you know, all there yet. Well, I and think that's a really important thing is that she's willing to do that, even though, you know, we can't find a, you know, all in one textbook for her other course because she can always switch back the next year. So, you know, sometimes people just have to try it first and, you know, decide if it works for them or not. Yeah, Elaine and I have definitely had conversations about it. And, and I will, I will obviously ask my students what they think about sort of all my various resources and links. Um, and resources that I'm using for the fall 2021 in my multicultural families course. You know, it's it's not perfect, but I also hope that maybe in the next year more will come out. Well, you know, it's always evolving. That's a good thing about OER. You know, there's going to be more every year. So hopefully within the arena of social justice, we as a group can increase um, yeah, th that those lenses for, for all of us who teach courses like that. Um, but in general, I think that the OER just provides, you know, equity and inclusion, which is so important, you know, for any type of field, right? You don't have to be just teaching a social justice course like I am, so. There was an uh, uh, earlier um, comment, uh, comments about your, uh, your email template and whether or not you'd be willing to share that in some manner uh, with others, because it sounds like it was such a, a great uh, document uh, to make that connection uh, and to, um, you know, kind of reach out to your colleagues. Yeah, I, Elaine, that's so funny. You were like, you should just read off the email because I was, you know, I didn't know if I should, but I, I was pretty proud of that email. And, you know, you just copy and paste it, you know, so I'd be happy to share that. I don't know how, but, you know, <laughs> I'm sure we'll figure it out. We'll okay. find a way. <laughs> <laughs> if it's possible we may be able to link it to the recording you know have if you can put it into some kind of document that's um 
shareable. Yeah, absolutely. And someone, someone said put a license on it too. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, a few other comments that have come in. Um, oops. About uh, someone from Hawaii saying that they take a mainland textbook and tailor it to locals. And then Lisa uh, says she volunteered to co author a chapter for an OER textbook for her composition department. And she wrote about and used a Black author who writes, who writes about Black lives as an example within the, uh, the chapter itself. This is really great feedback and examples. Thank you all for um, sharing your ideas in the chat. It, I guess it's a reflection of the many ways that people can, um, advocates can approach, uh, you know, DEI issues and the connection that you can make uh, with OER, right? And um, and the one thing too, I think uh, from your um, presentation and from your partnership. Um, you know, you had shared earlier that, you know, you've been working on the campus for many years, but you kind of just connected within the past year. And so, uh, you know, for, you know, OER advocates, you know, persistence is also, you know, this is an example of being persistent, right? Because the connection might be made to not today, but tomorrow. And, and here's the, the value in making that connection. That is an excellent point. <laughs> <laughs> I just say stick with it, you know. So someone, uh, Jennifer just mentioned that um, she read one of their uh, creative writing uh, teachers redesigned his entire class around OER so he could highlight diverse voices. Um, oh, and question from Carrie, have you incorporated open pedagogy and allow students to create material centered on their lived experience and their diverse voices? Jackie, has that been something that you've uh, thought about? So I, I definitely think in the future, um, but for this, this summer project for the teaching grant I mentioned, um, students are basically, we're, we're creating videos where students just talk about their lived experiences and what diversity, equity, inclusion means to them, what is cultural competence to them, what are goals that they have um, to, to grow in cultural competence, and they're a diverse representation of students on our campus. And so I haven't seen the product yet, but our, our global campus is creating the videos. So I know they're gonna be really, really good. I'm really excited about them. And so that's what we're gonna do is use those and and, and add those to the OER resources that other um, campuses could use. But that's one example, but I know there's so many more. There's a question from uh, Ramyana. Have you approached student government directly to educate them on OER and see how they can help in the promotion? We have a very strong relationship with student government. So they have even created a position within their own student government called the Director of Open Education. So our student government is called the Associated Student Government, the ASG is what we call them. So. Uh, for about the past four years, we've had a very strong relationship with them. Um, we've, I think we've figured out the formula is that that person in that role uh, needs to be a sophomore or junior, not a senior who's leaving. And so, you know, once they do the role, they kind of train the next person. Um, our, our student government rep this year was, she was an excellent advocate. She served, the, the rep always serves on our uh, campus advisory uh, group. And um, so, you know, she did some programming with the students. You know, we were all mostly virtual this year, but she did some virtual programming with the students. Um, she is actually the person who spearheaded um, getting the student government or writing the legislation for the student government to uh, divert some funds to the OER program. So uh, right now we're enjoying a very strong relationship with our student government. There's a question that came in the Q&A from uh, Caitlin. 
How do you balance wanting to provide zero cost open resources with wanting to make sure diverse authors on relevant course topics are compensated for their labor? So the program we've been talking about today, all these pro this program is funded, even the workshop, there's some funding provided for the faculty to take, you know, to spend the time learning and then to write the review. So if they're participating in this program, they are funded. We do have some other adopters on campus who don't participate in the program just because they've, you know, not shown interest. Uh, every year we have uh, more applications than we can fund with the exception of this year. And that's because we had extra funding from the student government. So we were able to uh, fund all of the projects that, uh, you know, were selected by the uh, campus advisory group and OER team. So, you know, if, if someone with a diverse voice applies for funding and we, you know, figure out that the project is viable, they wanna create, we, you know, they will be funded. They won't be creating it with no compensation. Uh, a question just came in. How much do you pay for writing a review? So the review was part of the workshop. We don't do just reviews just to be doing them. Um, this was, and this was the first year that I incorporated it into the workshop because I wanted to find a way for our campus to uh, contribute to the Open Textbook Library as reviewers, you know, in a more substantial way. Um, so. Uh, they, all the participants of the workshop were funded at $1,500 each, um, and that included writing the review, attending the workshop, um, deciding if they could uh, adopt or not, you know, adopt or find library resources. Um, and they also had to give a presentation at the end, you know, just kind of going over their experience and what they were going to do moving forward. And, um, you know, Jackie is one of our big success stories from that. Was the presentation to the cohort or was it to their uh, department? Or? So the presentation was to the cohort, um, the, the full OER team and the OER campus advisory group was also invited. Now, you know, it was virtual, so we didn't have as many uh, from our campus advisory group as we would have hoped, you know, cause everybody's busy, everybody's got Zoom fatigue. So, you know, it was, it was not to their department, no. But they do have to have um, their department chair um, sign off on their application saying basically, I know that this faculty member has applied to, you know, attend this program or applied for funding for OER. Um, so, you know, we just try to make sure that way that the people, you know, their, their supervisor in their department knows what they're doing. Are there any other questions uh, that you might have? Please uh, feel free to submit that through the Q&A um, or the chat. It's been coming through through the chat as well. A question just came in from Etta. Uh, do you have a set form or guide to help faculty review library resources to supplement or replace um, cost materials? We do not have a form for library resources for reviewing library resources, no. Uh, another question just came in from, uh, from Yana. What is the role of the OER advisory group? Great question. So our OER campus advisory group um, was a way for us to try to get more, more people on campus involved in the process. So, you know, we have this pot of funding, but we didn't want the people who work on the co-OER team, which are myself, two other, three other librarians, and uh, two people from Global Campus, uh, instructional designer and the uh, head of instructional design. We didn't wanna be responsible for just saying, oh, we're gonna pick these projects. Now, you know, we meet with the, the applicants beforehand before they submit to kind of help guide them through their applications. Um, and so we decided to form a campus advisory group because, you know, more advocates on campus, the better. Um, we have representatives from most of the colleges. 
So I think we have what, seven or eight colleges, I think. And we have reps from maybe four or five of them. Um, and we don't have one from agriculture yet. So of course, Jackie has been invited to join the OER Campus Advisory Group in the fall. Uh, we also have uh, the, one of the directors of the uh, Center for Accessibility. Our uh, Associated Student Government member is on the Campus Advisory. Uh, one of the Assistant Deans, Associate Deans of the Graduate School is on there. And then we also have some graduate students. And the Bookstore Manager, um, just uh, last March, just before we shut down for COVID, our bookstore turned over to a Barnes and Noble store. And so, you know, I immediately reached out and tried to start building a relationship with that manager. And, you know, because I'd heard so many things about how difficult this might be. And um, he's been invited to be on the campus advisory. He gets all the information, you know, that the other advisory members uh, get. He has not really participated and that's fine. So he doesn't do anything to hinder us, you know, which is great. Um, he provides uh, textbook adoption reports to me every semester if I ask for them. Um, and so what that group does is, you know, basically support our programs, talk up OER, um, and then review applications for funding. And so it requires, there's one required meeting per semester, but they can participate as much or as little as they um, have time to do. Wonderful. The um, roles of you know these advisory committees groups can be so um, help to facilitate uh, open initiatives on campuses. You know, especially when they're uh, comprised of diverse, uh, you know, uh, representative of the campus itself and all the different uh, constituencies. Um, are there any other questions from the uh, the audience right now? One thing I'd, I, I'd like to um, maybe ask uh, Jackie is, you know, um, what you may have uh, touched upon this earlier, but what has been the general response from your colleagues, you know, with your kind of very much uh, your advocacy for, uh, for OER? It's a good question. I would say half were just as clueless as me and just needed more, you know, influence, knowledge, you know, that push, right? And so they immediately went and signed up and wanted to learn more. And then I will say the other half, surprising, we're like, I don't use textbooks at all. <laughs> so, um, so, or just weren't interested at all. I mean, I only had one person who gave me a straight out, no, I'm not interested. Um, I like the textbook I'm using, which is great. Uh, you know, so, that's been the surprise. I think most people are just like me who just didn't know what they didn't know. And so that's why I think Elaine and I partnering up and reaching out to more colleagues outside of my unit uh, could be really advantageous for, for our campus. And, and then that I know Elaine is working on reaching out to instructors and faculty who teach our big gen ed classes, you know, with like hundreds of students. That's the, the sort of the faculty we're going to try to get to next. So and that person who said, no, I create my own materials, I immediately sent them a note and asked them if they wanted to create them as OER. We haven't heard back, but we'll, we'll touch, you know, we'll catch up with them again. Persistence, right. <laughs> and are there any, uh, uh, so there are plans moving forward with the two of you working together to further um, advocate for OER to get more faculty to maybe, you know, participate in your cohorts or the cohorts are going to continue right so this would be a good model yeah right and that's you know just a different program from our other you know big funded programs so we will continue the workshop program okay at this point i i'm not seeing any further questions was there anything that uh the two of you wanted to leave the audience with today? Um, just, you know, just to let you know, like the, the last slides had the link um, and the slides will be up with the presentations, I believe. So if anybody wants to link to those two resources I've mentioned that we'll be adding to our materials 
um, they'll be on the slide, links will be on the slides. All right. Um, well, I want to thank the two of you, Elaine and uh, Jackie. We appreciate uh, your sharing your expertise with us today. Um, I want to thank the audience for joining us today. Uh, we want to remind you that today's webinar has been recorded and will be um, shared in the coming weeks. Um, uh, you can subscribe to our YouTube playlist to receive a notification, slides and transcripts, and maybe even that template will be uh, shared along with the recording. Um, please keep the conversation going in uh, Slack. So I'm gonna just drop that link there if you haven't already joined the, um, the uh, Summit Slack. And um, if you are an OEN member, we, want, we hope that you'll also continue the conversation in the OEN Google, Google group. So thanks to you all for joining today's session. Thank you very much.